Ohio State University is the home to the world's largest collection of comic and cartoon art. Located right here in Columbus, the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum contains over 300,000 pieces of original art, 2.5 million comic strip clippings, thousands of graphic novels and comics and more. Or other words, somebody's got more stuff than the Columbus Rotary Office. <clears throat> um, Engagement coordinator Caitlin McGurk will discuss the library's incredible histories and holdings and explore the legacy of cartoon and comic art as told through the highlights of their collections. Caitlin has had two of the coolest gigs in the world, two of the coolest librarian gigs in the world. Of course, currently she's here um, at the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum. But before this, she was the founding librarian at the Schultz Library and Center for Cartoon Studies in Vermont, as in Charles Schultz, as in the Peanuts comic book, Snoopy, and the song that drives half of you crazy this time of year. So, Caitlin, come on up. Thank you for that introduction, even though you stole half of what I was going to say for my introduction. But anyway, um, hi everyone, I'm Caitlin McGurk. I am the engagement coordinator and one of the curators at the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum. It's a real honor to be asked to be here. Thank you so much. What a great group and a beautiful view, too. I'm really jealous that you guys get to be here all the time. Um, so what I'm going to do is a bit of a, an overview about the Cartoon Library. I don't know how many of you have been there or not. I'll talk a little bit about our history, some of our holdings, some of the features of our brand new building that some of you may have visited, and uh, exhibits and events that we have coming up. So um, has anyone been to the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library Museum by a show of hands? Almost no one. Okay, a few. So hopefully you guys will come and visit us after this. Um, as Scott said, we are the largest collection of cartoon and comic book art in the entire world right here in Columbus. And what I mean by that is uh, we have 300,000 pieces of original art, so the actual original drawings from comic books, New Yorker cartoons, things like that. 45,000 books, which are mostly graphic novels. Uh, 67,000 serial titles, which include 29,000 of what you guys would think of as regular single-issue stapled comic books. 3,000 linear feet of manuscript materials, so we do collect all of the paperwork corresponding to a cartoonist's life and career, so fan letters and contracts, receipts, things like that. And 2.5 million comic strip clippings and tear sheets, and that collection all came from one man who was keeping it in his house before he gave it to us. So if you ever visit us, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about him. So altogether, our holdings are just under 3 million, which is pretty, pretty tremendous. I'm going to sort of set the scene for talking a little bit about comics with the help of Calvin and Hobbes. Does everyone know Calvin, Calvin and Hobbes? Okay, hopefully most of you know that the creator, Bill Watterson, is, uh, is from Ohio. Uh, he's also a very good friend of our library, and I'm uh, very happy to say that we actually, uh, in our archive, have every single piece of original art that he ever created. From Calvin and Hobbes, his work from high school, his editorial cartoons when he was in uh, Kenyon College, and more. So, uh, very exciting. So anyway, I'll read this out loud to you guys. <clears throat> a painting, moving, spiritually enriching, sublime, high art. The comic strip, vapid, juvenile, commercial hack work, low art. A painting of a comic strip panel, sophisticated irony, philosophically challenging, high art. Suppose I draw a cartoon of a painting of a comic strip, sophomoric, intellectually sterile, low art. So what uh, Bill Watterson is trying to say here through the voice of Calvin and Hobbes are th is that comics have been always viewed as a lower art form, something that is considered to be made for kids only or made for the masses. And really when it first debuted in the newspapers in the late 1800s, was in there for commercial purposes. It was in there to sell more papers, not because of its brilliant artistic value. So we are really proud of the fact that at OSU, we are one of the first institutions in the entire world to treat this format uh, with the respect that it deserves. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about the, how that started. It was with this man. Uh, some of you may know him. Uh, this is a baby photo of Milton Kniff. Uh, are we all, or many of us familiar with who Milton Kniff was? Has anyone, did anyone know Milton? And, in person? Is anyone a friend of his? Okay, some people. So I'll give you a little bit of an overview for those who don't know him. Uh, Kniff was an Ohio native, uh, went to OSU, graduated in 1930, um, and went on to have one of the most successful careers as an American cartoonist. Uh, his, his most well-known features were Terry and the Pirates and Steve Canyon. 
These were adventure comic strips that ran in the newspapers. Um, in the 1970s, when Kniff started to retire from his career, he felt like he owed the entire success of his career to the education that he had uh, gotten at OSU. And so he wanted to donate all of his materials to us. So, um, you know, this is something that's only starting to change now, where comics are sort of becoming respectable and uh, academically acceptable and hip. Uh, but especially in the 1970s, that was not quite yet the case. And so when Kniff first made uh, the donation to OSU, embarrassingly enough, the libraries turned it away because the libraries did not really think it was a worthwhile format yet. But thankfully, uh, the journalism department accepted it because of the connection to newspapers. So uh, over in the journalism department, there happened to be this amazing woman uh, pictured on the left here, Lucy Shelton Caswell. Does anyone know Lucy? Some people might. So uh, uh, Lucy was a journalism librarian and a fan of comics, and she recognized the importance of this material when the donation arrived. And she didn't want to just let it sit and just be another you know, piece of the, the larger archive. So she set out to do something that she's now considered really a, a hero for in the, in the comic art world. She decided to start the world's first collecting cartoon art archive, which um, is a, an incredible thing for her to have done for many reasons. One, I will say, uh, comics are an incredibly male-dominated field, and so here's a woman, you know, being a, a comics expert. Two, OSU, of course, is you know the largest university in America, um, and in the 1970s, to be able to convince such a large university to pay attention to an art form such as comics and comic books was pretty pretty incredible feat for her to pull off, and she did it. Um, Kniff lived for about 10 years after he made the donation, and the two of them worked very, very closely together to establish uh, the library and, and, and help it grow. Uh, he was very integral during that time in uh, encouraging his contemporaries to also donate, so we just grew exponentially since then. Um, you know, some of his good friends that donated early on were people like Walt Kelly, who did Pogo, uh, Will Eisner, people like that. <clears throat> um, so back then we were just called the Milton Kniff Reading Room and we were just two converted classrooms in the journalism department if, it, if anyone got, got, to see it the, got to see us at that point. <clears throat> uh, for those of you who aren't super familiar with Kniff's work, um, I'm just putting up a, a slide from Terry and the Pirates. This is a scan of an original piece. Some of you probably know that uh, back in the day the comic section in any given newspaper was eight to ten pages long and every cartoonist had a full page to work on. So things have you know, dramatically changed at this point. Um, so this would be one Sunday page from Terry and the Pirates. Um, as I said, it was an adventure comic strip that took place in the mysterious Orient and was all about a female pirate called the Dragon Lady, really awesome uh, character in pop culture history. Uh, Kniff um, was known for his use of what's called chiaroscuro, it's an art term for very highly contrasted artwork. He was one of the first people to, to play with those really bold black and whites which give a really uh, kind of a, a dramatic feel. And also uh, one of the first cartoonists to experiment with very cinematic panel angles. So you can sort of see, you know, he plays with where the, the camera's eye view is and gives a whole new depth to the, to the, uh, the artwork. Um, to give you an idea of just how talented he was, again, this is what one day of comics would have looked like. This man was writing, drawing, and researching one of these seven days a week for about 40 years, on top of doing another comic strip at the same time, and also doing spot illustrations. He would do these uh, vaudevillian performances that we call chalk talks, things like that. So incredibly, incredibly talented man, one of the, one of the finest, and uh, incredibly influential on everyone who, who followed after him. <clears throat> and also the research for Terry the Pirates, he started doing that while he was still living here in Columbus at the Columbus Public Library. Uh, you know, this was a man who was writing about a, a foreign land that he hadn't even been to, and uh, the research was extremely important to him. So every single like war plane or anything that you see in Terry and the Pirates is precise to what it would have looked like at that time. It was uh, very, very important. Steve Canyon, of course, was his next big hit that a lot of people know of. It was one of the first comics that he uh, very seriously licensed and merchandised and uh, became extremely well known for. And here's the character of the Dragon Lady, which some of you may know from, from uh, Terry and the Pirates, the female uh, pirate. Um, just to, again, in a, give you an idea of how important Kniff was at the time, and unfortunately I can't be near the computer to read this to you, but this is one of the most incredible things we have found in his manuscript collection. So, like I said, we do collect all the paperwork corresponding to a cartoonist's life and career, and while cataloging his collection, we found this fan letter that was written to him in 1942, and it's written by John Steinbeck. And it is 
very overwhelming, just a total outpour of emotion and appreciation for, for Kniff's work. It's actually specifically centered around a kind of a crush that Steinbeck has on the Dragon Lady, so it's a little bit of a weird letter. But, um, you know, one of the reasons that I show this to people, and again, typically I'd read some of it, uh, <coughs> is because, you know, not only was he so huge that someone like Steinbeck would be writing him a fan letter, but also um, a lot of people that use our library, um, because we're a visual arts library, they assume that the manuscript materials are like the boring stuff, just the paperwork, but we find things like this in there all the time. We have letters that have been written to cartoonists from presidents, all kinds of people, so really, really amazing. <coughs> So I'll just talk a little bit about our, our physical spaces. So again, we started in just two converted classrooms in the journalism department. Uh, these were our offices, great 80s computer and telephone wire coming down from the ceiling. So I'm showing you guys this because if you've seen our new space, and I'll show you some photos of it, you'll see just how far we've come. <coughs> that was our reading room back then. And in 1989, we had completely outgrown this space. And so we moved over to this location, which is sort of below Marchand Auditorium, uh, next to the Fine Arts Library. Um, it was about 6,000 square feet. Uh, we used the walls of the reading room as our exhibit space where we just, you know, pinned up small shows. <coughs> and uh, by, well, by some many, many years ago, we had completely ran out of space there. We're operating out of two off-site storage areas. And so we started to fundraise uh, quite a bit of money privately, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, to move into this space. So this is Solvent Hall. Uh, it's the, at the gateway to OSU, um, right next to the Wexner Center. Many of you are probably familiar with it. We moved into Sullivan Hall exactly a year ago last week. So it's our third home and hopefully our permanent home. Uh, we went from having, like I said, 6,000 square feet in our previous location to now in this one having 40,000 square feet. So it's a tremendous expansion. It is also making us the, uh, the largest physical imprint for, uh, devoted to comics in the world. <coughs> Um, just to go over a few highlights, uh, one of the greatest features of the new building is that we have a state-of-the-art museum. Uh, it's always free and open to the public. There's three galleries in there. Uh, the one that I have an image of right now is uh, the Treasures Gallery, so it's co sort of our permanent collection where we highlight the, you know, the best of what we have. It's set up to be a, a teaching and learning exhibit, so it explores the entire chronology of, uh, of cartoon art. And, all the mediums that it's, uh, it's worked in, um, you know, the, the cases in there sort of begin with uh, hand-painted um, British uh, comic art prints from the 1700s and end with uh, uh, more recent um, comics that have come out in the past 10 to 20 years. So we've really, we've got it all. Uh, we have the other two galleries are rotating exhibits. They'll switch over about three times a year. Being that we're only a year old, we're only in our, our, third, lo our, our third rotation right now. Uh, if any of you did get to see us this summer, uh, you'll know that we did a Calvin and Hobbes retrospective, the first that's ever been done. Uh, Bill Watterson, again, is a very good friend of our libraries and allowed us to do this exhibit. Uh, just this exhibit alone brought in 12,000 visitors from all over the world. <coughs> and this is how our original art is kept. So, um, as Scott said, we do have an extremely uh, fancy, high security, Mission Impossible style uh, vault. Um, it is not accessible to the public. You can only see it if you work there or if you're on a special tour, which I hope I invite you all to come on at some point. Um, and uh, it's entirely temperature and humidity controlled. It's monitored 24 hours a day um, to make sure it doesn't, you know, lower or raise. And the idea behind that, of course, is that, you know, we have these brittle, brittle works on paper from the 1700s, but once you get those works into a controlled environment, they'll just sort of remain in stasis and they won't decay any further. So we have things where the color, again, from the 1700s looks like it was just, you know, uh, just colored yesterday. <coughs> One of the ways that we generate revenue for the cartoon library is by doing high resolution scans. So this is our fancy digital imaging lab. Um, we will very often have uh, major publishers who are doing reprint books. Say they're uh, publishing a book that's reprinting every single uh, Peanuts comic strip from 1953 to 1955. They'll actually get all of the scans from our collection for that. And we you know, charge a, a minimal fee for those scans and bring some money into the library. It's also there as a service for, for students and researchers as well. We have a classroom where we teach uh, up to five classes per week about uh, comics history out of this room. Uh, it's also one of the rooms that we have uh, guest lecturers speak in. 
But the main room for that is our Gene and Charles Schultz Lecture Hall. So Scott mentioned too uh, that uh, uh, Charles Schultz has been a, a big part of our, our lives uh, at the Cartoon Library. And uh, his widow, Jeannie Schultz, uh, has donated a tremendous amount of money and artwork to us and is an extremely good friend of ours and uh, gave us the funding to have a, a major lecture hall at the center of the building. So we bring in a lot of um, great guest lecturers to give talks in there, uh, all kinds of workshops for kids, for adults. Uh, in the spring, we had the creator of Swamp Thing come out and give a free uh, class on how to draw monster comics. So all kinds of fun stuff. This is our reading room. If you do ever want to access our collections, like I said, we are a uh, um, our stacks are closed off, but being that OSU is a land-grant institution, um, anyone from the public can come in. You don't have to have an application or you know, be researching a specific project. You just come in, you work with someone at the desk and ask them if you could see you know, 200 pages of original art from Milton Kniff, and we will just go into the vault and bring it right out to you, and you look at it all in there. So it also means that nothing circulates outside of our building. Even um, recent comic books or graphic novels that have come out, you can only read them in the reading room. And that's because we're here to preserve this stuff you know, until the end of time. So. Uh, so I wanted to go over a few highlights of the past year that we've had. It was really nice for me when I organized this to actually realize some of the major things that we've accomplished. Um, so like I said, we opened in November of 2013, so only a year ago. And uh, we had been fundraising for about 11 years. 90% of the project um, was privately fundraised, and that's $13 million. So there's only four of us that are full-time staff there, and that was literally us calling people, writing letters, things like that, to get this amount. So we've gotten uh, some incredible, incredible support that we're so thankful for. Um, I also wanted to, do to note that the donors are largely actually a non-OSU or Ohio um, affiliated, which means that, you know, for us, we're bringing a whole new audience of people out here. Um, you know, we're getting the attention of, uh, of different people, you know, across the world who are viewing us as a place that, you know, they want to, that they really believe in and want to support. <coughs> Um, our mission has been to bring visitors to Columbus and locals back to campus and to embed the Cartoon Library materials in OSU teaching and learning, which we've done very successfully. Again, we have classes, um, of up to five classes a week visit and do, uh, you know, use materials in, uh, from our collection in their coursework. Uh, we've served over 15,000 patrons, students, and researchers just in the past year. We've install, installed six state-of-the-art exhibits, uh, and I mentioned the uh, Calvin and Hobbes one, which is actually now traveling to France, which is pretty wonderful. It'll be on, on display in Paris. Uh, we've provided tours and classes for over 1,000 elementary, high school, and college students, um, and trained over 100 docents in partnership with the Wexner Center for the Arts. So I'll mention now, too, if you do want to make a visit to us, uh, we have a partnership with the Wexner Center's docent program. So if you ever wanted to get a guided tour, we give free guided tours. <coughs> Uh, we're the anchor of the Arts District, so uh, many of you probably know about the, um, the plans for the Arts District in, OS and in Columbus, and uh, the Cartoon Library and the new Sullivan Hall building is kind of considered to be the, the gateway, the anchor building for that. And uh, you know, as we bring more and more people to that part of campus, we're able to you know, support the arts even further. And um, we're also, our building is also a, a LEED certified. I'm sure many of you know more about what that means than I do, but leadership in, in energy and environmental design, I believe we are a silver star for that. <clears throat> so we keep, like I said, all of our original art in flat files here on site at the library. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, who Billy Ireland was. I see I'm quickly running out of time here. Um, so we've had several former names, but in 2009 we became uh, the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum. Does anyone know who Billy Ireland was by a show of hands? Okay, such an important person here in Columbus, and we're, uh, you know, it's part of our mission to sort of bring his name back in reg into regular use. <coughs> uh, this is the cover of the Columbus Dispatch on the day that Billy Ireland died. This is a full page front cover obituary for a cartoonist. Uh, he died in 1935. And he was the lead cartoonist for the Dispatch from the 1800s until he passed away in 1935. Um, he, uh, he worked for them from when he was 18 and, until uh, 55 years old. He died very young. Uh, his feature was called The Passing Show. It was a full page feature that would run every Sunday in the Dispatch. That's what it looked like. Um, Billy Ireland was entirely self-taught. 
the title, The Passing Show, was basically like his phrase for, you know, everyday life that just passes us by and the random events that happen in, our, in and around our city. And it was essentially a editorial comic all about everyday life in Columbus. So he talked about, you know, sporting events that were happening. He talked about, you know, women's fashion, different things in, in government, stuff like that. Uh, this is his rendering of Carmen, Ohio. It's now become a pretty popular rendering of it. <coughs> And he fought really hard for all kinds of, you know, the best sides of politics. He fought hard for women's suffrage. Um, I know you can't probably read this, but it says, uh, these, these queer looking birds can vote, but your mother can't. And uh, he's also considered the man who laughed the KKK out of central Ohio. Because in the 1920s, he was regularly featuring the KKK in the passing show and just making fun of them to raise people's awareness of the fact that they still had a presence here. So extremely important man. <coughs> And one of the ways that we can appreciate him most today, and hopefully this will you know, blow your mind uh, for people who aren't familiar with him, is the work that he did to beautify our city. So we're all familiar, obviously, with the uh, Scioto Mile River Walk with the swings and lights and how gorgeous it is. Um, it did not always look that way. In 1910, there was a really bad flood that completely destroyed the Scioto Mile. And it was, the riverbed was just left mud and broken down buildings, and it was you know, pretty, pretty gross. And it really infuriated Billy Ireland that it stayed that way for so long, because he knew that those bridges that go over the Scioto River, that would be people's first entrance into Columbus, and that would be their first impression of our town, was just this total wasteland. So in the passing show, he was regularly featuring drawings of what the riverbed looked like back then, with renderings of what he thought we should rebuild it to look like, and a bit of text trying to encourage voters to get some funding passed to beautify this neighborhood. So being that he died in 1935, he by a long shot did not live to see this, but when they rebuilt the Scioto Mile fairly recently to look as it does today, they based it off of Billy Ireland's drawings in his comic strip. So uh, our plan eventually is to have a tiny plaque somewhere in the Scioto Mile that says that, but currently most people have no idea that um, that, that was true and uh, that who he was. <coughs> One of the, the other greatest things about him is that he was Milton Kniff's mentor. Um, so this is a really special little piece to be able to share with you guys. Um, so when Kniff was in school at OSU as a teenager, in 1925, he was knocking on Billy Ireland's door at the Columbus Dispatch, asking him to teach him how to draw and to give him a job. And so Billy Ireland actually ended up hiring Milton Kniff for his very first drawing job at the Dispatch. And Kniff considered Ireland to basically be a father figure for the rest of his life. Um, <coughs> This is a, a, an amazing thing for us to have in our collection. This is the actual piece of original art that Kniff did for Billy Ireland to convince him to hire him. So I know you can't see it too well, but basically uh, when Kniff first went to Ireland's office at the dispatch, uh, Ireland's response was, you know, if you know, if you draw me something that makes me jump out of my seat, kid, maybe I'll hire you. And so the next day, Kniff went back with this. And you can see he's drawn the stadium in there, and there's the observatory. He's going to ye dispatch. And then he's drawn Billy Ireland jumping out of his seat in it. And so from that piece, Billy Ireland hired him, and Kniff went on to be the you know, incredible, incredible person that we know him to be. Um, uh, one of the reasons that even, obviously, people here today don't even know who Billy Ireland was, but we know who Kniff was, uh, you know, Kniff's, Kniff's legacy kind of long overshadowed Billy Ireland's. And the reason for that is because, you know, at that point after he was hired, working at the dispatch for a little while, Kniff was immediately recruited from newspapers in New York City and, you know, all these major coastal papers, and so he left and decided to work elsewhere. Billy Ireland was recruited from those papers, it courted for them his whole life, and refused to leave Columbus. He only wanted to write and draw about Columbus. This is the city that he cared about the most. So uh, such an incredible person. The fact that someone can have that kind of local power as a cartoonist in our town is, is really quite a huge deal. <coughs> um, before I have to finish, I want to just uh, let you guys know our website is cartoons.osu.edu. It's the easiest place to find out about you know, all the amazing things we have in our collection, what kind of events and exhibits we have coming up. Um, and I'm going to end by telling you guys uh, just kind of a fun fact. This is a really ridiculous drawing that I did for another presentation. Um, Ohio, many people don't know, has, there are more cartoonists from Ohio than any state in America. We have no idea why, but th this is where um, some of the most important people are from. A few that I'll mention is this guy, Richard Outcult. He's from Lancaster. Uh, Richard Outcult is the creator of something called Hogan's Alley, also known as the Yellow Kid. 
and it is the very first American newspaper comic. So the birth of American newspaper comics in 1896 was created by a man from Ohio. Right after doing that, he did Buster Brown, which I assume most of you at least know the term Buster Brown, if not for the shoes. So um, uh, Richard Al called again from Columbus, uh, from, uh, from, from Ohio, uh, you know, became one of the, became the, um, the first newspaper cartoonist. And the reason I included this is because uh, his creation, The Yellow Kid, from his comic strip Hogan's Alley, was also the very first pop culture character, The Yellow Kid, to be licensed and merchandised. So this is the dawn of pop culture mass media merchandising that began with this guy and of course continued on with Buster Brown. For those of you who don't know, you know, Buster Brown shoes, Mary Jane shoes, those were just literally the, the way that uh, this artist had been drawing the shoes on the specific characters in his comic strip, and a shoe company literally bought the image of that shoe and turned it into uh, a major merchandise. So, quite an important person. Uh, Edwina Dumb, she was around in Columbus in, um, I believe, uh, 1908. Edwina Dumb is the very first American uh, uh, political cartoonist from Columbus, Ohio. Uh, for working for the Columbus Monitor um, as a political cartoonist before the women's right to vote was even passed. So, very important person. <clears throat> Those are some of her political cartoons. And of course, many of you probably know this, um, the very first superhero, the very first comic book, Action Comics number one, which, which is the birth of Superman, was born in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, <clears throat> So uh, Siegel and Schuster were the creators of Superman. They were just teenagers making a, this is a, their self-published little magazine about Superman when they were in school in Cleveland. And of course it went on to be you know, one of the most well-known comics characters in the entire world. There's also people like Harvey Pekar, who is a considered the man who um, created what we call um, personal comics, diary comics that are about everyday life, sort of memoir pieces. He was from Cleveland as well. And Jeff Smith, some of you may be familiar with his name. Jeff Smith is a, a cartoonist who was born and raised in Columbus. And uh, when he was going to OSU, um, was making a comic for The Lantern called Thorn. And it was just a comic strip he was making while he was a student here. After graduating, decided to turn it into a comic book that he was self-publishing. And he is now internationally the most successful young adult cartoonist. So uh, a very, very proud history that we have here. And I have this up just to say that at the Cartoon Library, we're trying to show that, you know, comics can be just as important as football here in Ohio. So, <laughs> and that's it. <clears throat> I can take questions if anyone has any questions. Does, do Mad Magazine or New Yorker have a niche in your archives? Yes, we have uh, one of the largest collections of original art from Mad Magazine. Um, if, if everyone remembers Mad pretty well, we have uh, a lot of the original art from the fold-in feature that was done by Al Jaffe, that feature that folded in. He's now 96 and still does them for Mad Magazine. We have a, a lot of that art as well. Um, and New Yorker cartoons and Esquire, that's, I mean, in the hundreds of thousands probably. So, anyone else? Yes, sir. A lot of people have followed Prince Valiant since 1938. Do you have anything by Hal Foster? Yes, we do. We have about uh, 40 pieces um, from Prince Valiant. Uh, a lot of, I could be wrong, but I believe that he had either graduated from or had some association with Syracuse University because most of his materials are there. But we do have a lot of the originals, and uh, I really encourage you to come see our museum because there's one tr uh, Prince Valiant piece that's always on display in our treasures gallery, and it's literally uh, almost the size of that screen. He worked larger than any cartoonist <laughs> known to man, so they're uh, really tremendous, amazing pieces to see in person. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Baker. This is a gift thank from you. Argo and Lini Jewelers. So thank you for Wonderful. coming. Thank you Appreciate so much. It. My pleasure. Thank you.